All right, welcome to our slightly late Digital Citizenship Academy for Parents. Um, we, of course, had some technical difficulties here on our end with some Wi-Fi, but now we are ready to go. And so um, before we kind of get into this, I'm just, you know, double checking here. Hopefully um, this is going through for you guys. And um, I'm going to just jump kind of back and forth here. Again, for those of you that may be joining us, this is our Alice Al EdTech Parent Digital Citizenship Academy. This is going to give us a little bit of an overview about uh, digital citizenship and um, how to hopefully have a conversation perhaps with your own child, niece, nephew, anyone along those lines. So we're just going to assume everything's working here and uh, we're going to go ahead and get going. Um, so you can see right here we have the tinyurl.com forward slash digsit parent. That will take you to this presentation. You can do that now. You can do that a little bit later on. Um, and so give you a second to kind of look at that. Take that in. Right now I'm seeing if I can find my feed on my phone because I'd like to be able to uh, see your comments and currently in the mode I am in, I am not able to do that. So we're just gonna hope our technology is working here. Um, this is coming at us from Salinas, California, South Bowl capital of the world. Many of you have heard me say that before. Oh, looks like we're good to go. So feel free to follow along, comment, like, whatever you would like to do. So the Alice Al Education Technology Department consists of three people. You can see myself, Ben Cogswell. I'm on Twitter at Ben underscore Cogswell. We have our wonderful director, Joshua Harris, uh, Josh Harris. And you can find him at on Twitter at EdTechSpec. <clears throat> and then we have George Lopez. Not the George Lopez, but a wonderful George Lopez. And you can find him on Twitter at New Impulse. And so uh, tonight's focus, we're going to go ahead and go over uh, these things, living in the 21st century, talk a little bit about what digital citizenship is, um, go over introductions, and uh, then some of our next steps and um, we're going to probably take about half hour, 45 minutes. You can join now. You can come in later. So first, I want to talk a little bit about living in the 21st century um, and a little bit how times have changed and therefore maybe some of our education um, or the way we're going to teach has changed. So kind of here's our first food for thought, our, our first question um, to ponder, which is, if you needed help with your homework, what did you do? I know a lot of times when I needed help with my homework, most of the time it was ask mom, uh, maybe ask my big sister. Um, she was a great resource. Uh, sometimes, of course, go to the library. Of course, now if we flip that, over to what do our students have today? What options do our students have today? I think many of us would say the number one and number two search engines in the world, which would be number one, uh, Google, and number two, second pop most popular would be YouTube. Um, there's lots of great things you can learn on there. I, of course, I think mom, dad, big brother, and sister are also on that list, uh, teacher as well. But it's just amazing the amount of information the students can get nowadays right at the tips of their fingers. And so, uh, next question about framing, living in the 21st century. When you were young, where did you go to get the latest news? We have, of course, uh, lots of news. I remember newspaper. We have the television. And finally, I remember young, of course, the radio. And so I remember I was watching the news when my parents had it on. Now I think uh, a lot of people tend to get their news from their phone, um, whether that's social media, whether that's the local news app. 
Um, definitely, I know newspapers have had a hard times over the last few years, uh, at least deliver newspapers. And so the where we're getting our news is, is definitely um, changed. And I think you look at some of the things <clears throat> that have broken first by people on Twitter or other social media platforms rather than simply by watching, you know, the special special edition news doo, 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 coming on. Um, and so basically, of course, I just answered that question. Where do we go now? Here's the point. Times have changed. Um, and so how are we thinking about, you know, how's parenting changed? Uh, how has teaching changed? I mean, there's there's lots of major changes um, that have happened. I mean, just look now, if, if you were to give a lot of young younger kids a CD, uh, they might not know what to do with it, let alone a cassette tape, which really isn't that old. Um, when you look at now, just the access to music instantaneously uh, everywhere. Um, so what that brings us to our topic of what is digital citizenship? Uh, I'm going to pause here just for a second. All right. Make sure that, so all right, make sure you guys can hear me. looks like it's going pretty good um, as far as the lag. Uh, so what is digital citizenship? Uh, please feel free. Uh, jump in at any time. Ask any questions. Hello, Mr. Guerra. Great to have you. Uh, what is digital citizenship? I think um, we look at computers and and a lot of people, whether you say digital citizenship, well, I think a lot of people think of maybe cyberbullying, uh, social media. How are we acting on that? Uh, I think it's a lot more than that. And so when I look at our devices, I think, quote, Spider-Man, you know, Peter Parker, Uncle Ben. With great power comes great responsibility. There are so many amazing things you can do online. And so are we teaching, what are we teaching our kids? How are we teaching our kids to interact? Are we showing them the superpowers that they can have? Or on the other hand, are they getting into the uh, dark webs? Um, I always make this um, comparison. I think that uh, we teach our kids to look both ways when they're crossing the street. But... Uh, a lot of times we maybe just hand them the device and expect them to know what to do. Very interesting. Just kind of having my daughter uh, got her first iPod today that she had uh, got some money from winning a film festival. And she bought her first iPod today. And just kind of the things that go along with that, the access she has. Um, and and it's very interesting. I mean, I don't know anybody talking to her about email. Uh, how do you organize your email? Nobody sat down and, and taught many of us. And we just kind of had to figure it out ourselves. And so when we're giving our kids these devices, what are we having them do with them? Are we showing them the super side or are they getting caught up maybe in the uh, negative stuff? Uh, here is a great sketch note by a wonderful Sylvia Duckworth. Um, and it just kind of goes to why do we teach digital citizenship? I think this is good for teachers. I think this is also good for parents. Just this whole thing, right? We can't tell them not to use it or be careful and then put our heads in the sand. We need to teach them how to be safe and responsible because they're going to use it anyways. True that, Sylvia. Um, another quote by a gentleman, Kevin Honeycutt, basically goes, uh, kids are on the digital playground and nobody's on recess duty. We're letting them use all these different apps, but are we really getting in there and, and experimenting, seeing them? Um, the possibilities, the scary things about them, what people can do, what they can't do. So we're going to play uh, a little game, or I'm going to have you do a little thinking rather than just kind of spoon feed you, hopefully, um, about what is digital citizenship. This is a scope and sequence from Common Sense Media. Shout out to Common Sense Media. I'll talk about them a little bit later. They are a nonprofit organization, and they provide lots of great resources to parents, teachers, um, community advocates that are interested in learning more about digital citizenship. Um, from my understanding, they're revamping a lot of their work right now, but, um, this is their, what they call their scope and sequence. Basically, if you break down digital citizenship into some teachable chunks, what would that look like? Because it's a big thing. What really is being a digital citizen? Um, so they break it down and kind of to these tenets, internet safety, relationships and communication, cyberbullying, self image and identity, privacy and security, digital footprint and reputation, information literacy and creative credit and copyright so we're going to kind of talk about what those different things mean and give you a few examples as well again uh, thanks for joining me Heidi if you guys have any questions feel free to add them in the chat there is a little bit of a delay but I will do my best to answer them 
So here is our, our, our first. Looking at the, um, if you're watching, you can see there's the eight boxes on the bottom, uh, with the scope and sequence from Common Sense Media. And we're going to kind of take a look at our first little definition here and think about it. And so one aspect of digital citizenship is managing your online information, which would include keeping information secure from online risks, creating strong passwords, avoiding those scams and schemes, fishers, spear fishers, whale fishers, all those different kind of phishing, and of course, analyzing privacy policies. Interestingly, and inter interestingly enough, I just, um, NPR uh, did a podcast, I think it was from, um, it was on yesterday, uh, radio, and they said, uh, they did a study where they uh, put privacy policies, signed people up for a fake social media, and like analyze how long people would, this was an NPR, this was another company, how long would people actually uh, analyze the privacy policies? And on average, the people that signed up for this fake social media network analyzed them for about 14 seconds, wouldn't take them about half an hour to read the policy. In that policy, they put some crazy things like you'd give your firstborn child up so um think about it that myself how well do we know our privacy policies so you guessed it folks which one was it you can see here privacy and security um on that topic of privacy and security i thought this was definitely an interesting uh, graphic that actually my buddy george lopez shared with me um so let me break this down if you're watching and maybe uh, or just listening uh, basically, the gentleman who kind of came up with passwords trained, he, he didn't really know what he's doing. He's like, well, this is new. I'm going to make some passwords. This seems to make sense. And basically, they found, you know, your common password, which includes maybe some capital letters, um, some special characters, a punctuation mark, some numerals in there, just like a, um, a different mix. Basically, when you run um, the analytics on those, a uh, computer or could guess that in about three days at a thousand guesses a second versus if you put a string of four random words together like correct horse battery staple it would take about a thousand guesses per second so it's definitely interesting when we're when we're thinking about passwords um this is something we kind of we kind of looked at However, our, again, what are our kids doing? What are their passwords? I know it's hard sometimes for kids to remember passwords, but how do we teach them to have um, some of those strong passwords? So definitely some good conversations to have. Um, where do you keep the passwords? Do you write them down? Um, for me, I make my daughter give me all of her passwords for right now, and we keep them in a spot, and that's just part of the deal. She wants her electronics, and we need to have access to those. Um, just like as a parent, we're responsible and tell our children when they're 18. That includes offline and online. All right, moving on. Um, also, I think I've noticed a lot of people, I didn't realize this until maybe a few years ago, but when you're surfing online, there, you definitely want to look on your uh, address bar or your Omnibox. And when, you're, when you see on your Omnibox, you can see right now, if you're looking at my screen, there's a little lock. And basically, that lock means that website should be secure when you're transmitting information back and forth. Um, below you see an example it says your connection for this site is not secure so that little eye up in your address bar you can kind of click on it I'll we'll kind of bring up a live demo here you kind of click on it you can see I was checking out my internet speed here you can see that this is secure with my information if it's not secure well you need to think twice um, about what kind of information you are submitting on that site because you just never know hello Wendy thanks for joining us Hope you're having a good night. So we went over uh, privacy and security. So let's take a look at our next possible definition here, our next aspect, scope and sequence, when it comes to digital citizenship. So another thing we need to think about besides privacy and security is protecting, um, and again, some of these do overlap, but having how do they protect their privacy, respect others' privacy? Um, I think it's like this whole notion that the digital world is permanent. When you put something up there, you never know what's going to happen with it. It could be copied. It could be shared. It could be reposted. So kids really need to self-reflect before they self-reveal, and they need to consider the impact of sharing. So thinking about our options that are left, um, if you're here with us, take it a second to think which one of those could it be. And so sports fans, da 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 this one has to do with what they call your digital footprint or your online reputation. 
what are those little footprints in the sand that you are leaving? Um, some people like to refer to this as a digital tattoo because um, footprints can be washed away by the ocean, but tattoos are a little bit harder to remove. Um, <clears throat> I thought this was a great quote. Uh, you can see the source down there on the bottom of the slides. When you share, what are you saying about yourself? Um, so this guy named Dan Schwabel, Dan Schwabel, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, your first impression isn't made with a firm handshake. It's made with a Google search. Um, it's just amazing how many, uh, I think that I've heard lots of stories about um, possible, uh, when you're getting hired, a company or a corporation, looking at people's Facebook page, doing a Google, Google search, seeing what pops up. I mean, I can't even imagine when I was a kid, like if I would have had a chance to post certain things online, what would I have posted? Um, and what would have people been able to found, find about me 20 years later? So definitely, how do we start teaching those kids what, what they share? They really want to try to, when they go outside, you know, we always, in public, a lot of times we do try to put our best foot forward. Um, is that what we're doing when we're online, which can be a very, very public space? Um, also, I saw this about, uh, what was this? During the NFL draft, there's this young gentleman. Um, and unfortunately, he made some poor decisions in high school or college. And he tweeted some um, inappropriate comments, like we've heard lots. And now all of a sudden, that has a major effect on him. His digital footprint, his digital tattoo has been left. And, you know, who knows how this is going to f affect his career, but definitely that, that one or two or three perhaps tweets that were inappropriate when he was just a high schooler, they left a mark on him. Um, and so we're living a day where our, our mistakes, they follow us around. So you've seen we've went over privacy and security, and we went over digital footprint and reputation. So taking about uh, thinking about the next aspect of digital citizenship. Um, giving kids a chance to explore their digital lives and kind of thinking about offline versus online identity. What are the benefits and risks of presenting themselves as different personas? Um, <coughs> excuse me. I think about, uh, not that I really have experience with this, but I think about, you know, sometimes those dating apps where people put uh, one picture of themselves and you hear these stories, I've seen them in real life, and they're just a completely different looking person. Um, and how does that affect the sense of self and their reputation and relationships? I know from some of the research, uh, Instagram is, is not the best, you know, for female, young females, because just it's, it's very image based and, and what they're posting on there and, and how they can start comparing themselves to each other. And how are we having those conversations with the kids, um, before just giving it to them? And it goes really to, you guessed it, if you were out there, self image and identity, uh, it's interesting because obviously kids can have a self-image and identity offline, but is it the same online? Uh, this was a great uh, comic I found by com Comical Concept. And just how, you know, the Facebook version of you versus the realistic version of you. Again, so if you're listening, I can see a guy jamming on a guitar, flipping on a skateboard. He looks like he's pretty in shape, kind of maybe a little buff. Maybe in reality, he's sitting on his couch and he has some uh, Cheetos all over himself. And he's been enjoying a few adult beverages. Um, and so how are, we, how are we portraying ourselves? It's so easy, I think, on Facebook to uh, post all the best things of your life, right? And people see a certain version of you. And um, is that version of you the real of you? And how do we uh, deal with that? You know, what we're portraying versus is what a reality. And how are we showing that? Um, so definitely as, as you're thinking about that and we're thinking about, again, our children and what are they doing and how are they portraying themselves? And, you know, are we aware of how they are portraying themselves. Are we, if they're on Facebook, are we friends with them? Are we looking at their feed? Are we having conversations with them? Are we letting them look at our feed and talking about what we're posting? Um, so again, just some, some good conversations to have about your self image and your self identity and, and not to necessarily get caught up in all that in comparison. I think a lot of times we compare ourselves to others a lot easier. A uh, great quote, comparison is the thief of joy. And, um, <clears throat> So I think when you, we see all those posts and we start comparing ourselves, how does that also affect our self-identity? Um, so definitely some good food for thought. So you can see we've got three down. we got about five more to go here. Um, so the next one has to do with this whole idea of copy and paste culture, um, addressing pa plagiarism and piracy. 
uh, reflecting on rights and responsibilities of creators in online spaces and learning about copyright and fair use. I think a lot of us are guilty at some point of just going online, seeing a cool image we like, putting it on like a party invitation or uh, possibly, you know, um, a cool post. But is that ours? Do we have the right to share that stuff? <clears throat> and how do we know? Um, how do we know whether we have right, the right to share it? And and where do we go if we're looking for things that we can share? And that's okay. Um, that's referred to, if you're not aware, as kind of the creative commons. You can look that up, creative commons. And there's different ways you can share things like, hey, anybody can use this. To You can use this as long as you attribute me. Uh, you can use this non-commercially. Or you can use this if you give me the dinero. Um, so to be aware of, of, you know, that copy and paste culture. Uh, so which one is it? is it? Yep, I think you got this one. Good job. Creative, credit, and copyright. So this is pretty simple. Um, thinking about just even a Google search. So if you're looking at my screen, you can see right now I did a Google search on plagiarism and piracy online. So one of the greatest things that you can use in that Google search, it's a little bit more tricky sometimes to find on your phone. This is done on a computer is if you do your Google search, of course, you can see I'm under Images. Uh, click on the Tools button, and then you can see Usage Rights, and you can click Label for Reuse. And so those will be images, uh, depending upon how you're using them or what your search settings are, that you can use just the way you want to. Um, and so I think a lot of parents aren't aware of this, and if we're parents aren't aware of this, how are our children aware of this? Um, there's lots of sites that, you know, that you log on to and they provide images and you can use them. Um, but there's lots of sites that don't. So just being aware that not everything out there, I can just take it. I don't know how many times I've seen students copy and paste from Wikipedia or from other side because, hey, you know, we're teaching kids to cite their source. But, you know, we also need to teach kids how to do things like, oh, you can instead of just copying and paste this, you can reword this in your in your own words and still cite your source. And just making them aware of those. Remember, we can't just take what's out there, right? And beyond that, not just showing them, you know, if you can't find it, make your own. I don't know how many times we could just maybe take our own picture or do our own drawing. I think that's even more powerful than using somebody else's contributing. Um, if you're looking for some sites, uh, Pixabay is a great site. Flickr has lots of great images people allow you to use. There's even more. Again, just do a... a you can do a Google search. They're only a Google search away. <clears throat> so we got about four down here. Um, and um, so our next one has to do with interpersonal versus intrapersonal skills. And so how can we strengthen and make our online communities positive and that communication? And what are we really doing with our online interactions? And again, some of these are, are, are uh, overlap as they should because, you know, some of this stuff is not just very cut and dry. So giving you a second to think, could that be internet safety, information literacy, cyberbullying, relationships and communication? Ding, ding, ding for the win. Relationships and communication. You got it. So this is a big one when I think about relationships and communication. Um, and so we think about who is our audience? It's amazing when I when I see students start to use tools like Google Classroom, how they just all of a sudden just throw like they text talk, right? They put they put all the short the short words in there. They don't use capitals. They don't use periods. And I think there's a time and place to, for that. You know, like we talk to our friends is much different than we talk to our our boss. And so, how are we teaching kids like to to navigate those things? You know, when we teach, when kids and they go up and they see strangers, you know, go up and introduce yourself. But um, if you're maybe talking, if you're you're texting with your aunt, you know, perhaps you're sending a message to a friend. What kind of message are you sending? Um, and what is it saying about you? Again, thinking about who is that audience that you may be interacting with. Um, because again, building those relationships and the way we communicate with people it really says something about us. Like when we're communicating, of course, face-to-face, -face, we see facial expressions, but 
don't know how many times I've seen a text that's been taken in the wrong way. And so making sure the way we're communicating with people, <clears throat> um, we're keeping those relationships. So I think for me, I think one of the things we've really tried to work on is making sure our daughter is using Google Hangouts and trying to communicate with us that way um, or that we're texting her, starting to build those habits and what that should look like. Um, trying to encourage her to send emails, even as thank you notes. You know, it definitely is more personal to send a thank you note in the mail, but they also need to learn how to send some of those uh, more, you know, uh, notes to family members uh, through email as well. So teaching them to think about how they're framing what they're saying online. So that's uh, five of the scope and sequence from Common Sense Media Down, and we have three more to go. So if you're still with me, thanks for uh, joining me. Again, this can be watched now. This can be watched later. You can access the slides anytime you'd like. You can fast forward. You can rewind. Again, shout out to Common Sense Media for a lot of the work that they've done. So in our next scope and sequence, let's see here. Hopefully these X's are right. I'm looking at it again. I'm like, didn't we do relationships and communication? Let me see. Yeah, it looks like we did. So it looks like we should have an extra X here. But anyways, this one, because the X is in the wrong place, I'm just going to give it to you. Information literacy. Uh, that's what happens, right? Anyways, so information literacy is really being able to find and evaluate, use information effectively, um, and see if it is a valid source. Um, <clears throat> I think about being taught how to use a card catalog, but now kids or adults we send them into Google there's two million bajillion search searches how do we teach kids to get through that information and to find something that's valid um, we ourselves are super guilty of this BuzzFeed News provided BuzzFeed News provided this article about how fake is your news and how the top Facebook engagements for the top 20 election stories so if you go back to this data you can see here that mainstream news dip below fake news from August to election day that we ourselves were not doing a good job of verifying sources and this isn't kids this is adults and so if adults are uh, having problems with it then how are our kids having how are we teaching them how to do that here's a great site very great in fact we're going to exit out of the presentation here for a second and let's go check this out so if you haven't heard of the pacific northwest tree octopus um Definitely, definitely something we should be aware of because they're endangered, if you didn't know that. Um, they're very rare. They could be found, as you can see here, in temperate rainforests. Um, I got some great pictures here. Oh, well, this is, excuse me, media sightings. Here's some great pictures of the sightings of the Pacific Northwest tree octopus. Well, he's grabbing some dinero there. Yes, of course, at this point, I'm sure you've realized that this website is a fake and made up site. But you'd be surprised how many kids we look at this, that I see them look at this. And in the beginning, they're saying to themselves, hmm, I think this must be real. We should save this. What are we going to do? We're going to save money. But if we dig in a little deeper and we see this guy, Lyle, um, I think this is going to, I clicked on the wrong one. Yep, we don't want the email from Lyle. Um <laughs> If we go to, to the about, let's see here. Let's go to home. Sorry if I'm uh, getting you a little sick, scrolling up and down a little bit fast there. Let's see here. Here we go. Made in Cascadia. Let's check this out. So here's the Republic of Cascadia. Um, so we're already kind of wondering about what this place is. looks a little bit interesting. I can see here some Cascadia blogs. Um, Octopus. Wristlet, it looks like some very interesting stories here. Bees and men, the riddle of flying saucers. Hmm. So kind of taking a look at this, the Bureau of Sasquatch Affairs, the Sasquatch Melissa and Militia and the Tree Octopus, all sites that are on this. Um, definitely looks a little bit like I'd question this. And so when kids are looking at these things, or, or even adults, are we looking at them and we're thinking about, is this real? Who posted this? Who made this? Where's the person? Is there a about section on the page? Diving in a little deeper, um, there's a great quote. It says, you know, the best filter is the one between their ears. Um, and so the one between your ears, that would be your brain. So are we using that brain? 
So again, this has to do with evaluating sources. And so again, when we think of digital citizenship, all of these things are under there. And I don't, I don't necessarily think it's just the school system's job to help teach our kids these things. Um, I think they also, we also need to take some responsibility as parents as well. So we got two more. Um, we got internet safety and we have cyberbullying. And so this, the second to last one, and then I'm just going to show you a little bit about common sense media. The second to last one, it just basically says the internet is amazing. We need to use it safely and distinguish between inappropriate and positive connections. And these are the foundational keyword there. Foundational skills are just the beginning. So you guess it, folks, internet safety. Um, so there is a very popular site. It's called Robux, I guess. I've never seen played it. Uh, my kids haven't played it. But basically, yes, if you have a Google account as a kid, you can log in and you can just start chatting with people. And do you know who these people are? And this is not the only game I've seen where kids do, can start chatting with people without even signing in. And so this kind of goes again like, what are our kids playing? Are we taking the time to look at these games and see who they can interact? Because maybe like coolmathgames.com, if you go there, it's not really about math. Uh, sorry to uh, break the news to you. But... Um, Definitely, it's very easy to get sucked in, and you never know who's on the other end of that. Um, and so kind of just checking, you know, who are our kids interacting with? On the other hand, you know, there's lots of great places where you can and go get questions. But making sure to have those conversations. Like, don't just talk to strangers online. Because, um, like, oh, I can't see them. I must be safe. I'm at my own home. But where does it stop? Where does it start? Where does it end? And so our last one, you guess it's Cyberboy, and that's the one you hear about the most. Um, and so how can we encourage kids to be upstanders and build positive communities and, and start posting good things? Um, there is a great video. It's about uh, Daniel Kui. It's a Facebook video. You can Google it and check it out, Daniel Kui. Um, maybe put Daniel Kui soccer if you're looking for it. Um, lots of digital drama. And I think this is a good one. Even before you speak, I've seen it before you speak, before you post. And I think we should just change it before you share. Um, cause I feel like that covers both speaking and online interactions. So we ask ourselves these questions. Think, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Um, sources, cengage.com. I also like the way, uh, Josh Harris the EdTech director puts it, uh, if you wouldn't say it to your grandma, you probably shouldn't post it. But sometimes I think, you know, kids, their brains are still developing. They don't always make the best decisions. Um, I don't think just blocking it and removing all these options from your kids uh, is the best solution. I think it's just being aware and having these conversations. And, yeah, check their hit cookies every once in a while. Check their history. Um, excuse me, not their cookies, their history. Have some cookies. Maybe you're having one right now. So making sure that we think before I post. Also, some tips for responding to cyberbullying. Um, so I think that from what I've heard, a lot of the problems with us as, as, I guess, as parents is sometimes our kid will bring this issue to us that maybe they're being bullied and we're like, all of a sudden we flip out and we take away their devices and say, you know, we don't want you to have that chance to be exposed out there. But then guess what? The next time the, that happens with either another device or to the same kid, they're not necessarily going to come to us. We, I think we have to think very carefully about how we're responding. And so on this graphic, you can see don't respond, don't retaliate, block the bully, tell a trusted adult, um, save evidence. Um, so a good question, and I, I think uh, for ed educators and parents, at what point as a parent um, do you let the school know about cyberbullying? So basically, um, if... The, the, the cyberbullying incident that could be happening at home on a personal device, if it's affecting your child at school, then it is an issue that should be brought up in the school. Um, whether it's kids between two schools or kids in the same school, you know, if it's affecting how they're doing at school, that should brought be, to be brought to the attention of the teacher or the administrator. Um, and of course, use your best judgment. And so with that, I just kind of want to give, you know, about maybe five, ten more minutes, um, a quick overview of Common Sense Media. Uh, again, Common Sense Media, it's a nonprofit organization that offers lots of tools about digital citizenship uh, for parents and for teachers. Some great things. I love it. 
Um, so if you're looking to go to Common Sense Media, you can go to commonsensemedia.org. And I'm going to go there right now. Um, but I, a lot of times I show this to educators, but we're going to kind of look at it as a parent. So again, if you're watching with me right now and you're at commonsensemedia.org, or if you go there later on, one of the things you want to see is at the top, there's different tabs. And so there's one tab for parents, there's one tab for educators, and there's one tab for advocates. I see a lot of times educators log in as parents and vice versa. But you can see here there's tons and tons of great resources here on this web page. Everything from reviews of movies, television, uh, YouTube channels, games. It gives you top picks of movies, to, uh, apps, websites to watch with your family. Um, there's some family guides. I love Device Feed Dinner. You may have seen the uh, commercial they did with Will Ferrell. Um, they got the K-5 through guide. They share a little bit about parental concerns, technology addiction, news and media literacy, uh, marketing to kids, pretty much anything under the sun. They've got it all here. Of course, videos, news and advice, um, a great Latino section for uh, the Spanish speakers um, out there or Spanish families, parents, and then, of course, some research as well. But one of the things I love is uh, sometimes my kids, they ask me, hey, dad, can I see that movie? You know, I know what was it? Black Panther, for example, has been a very popular movie lately, Black Panther. And so, do a little search for it, Black Panther. I just click in there, I do a search for it, it brings up all of it. So when I can see Black Panthers, let's go ahead and dive in here and see what this is. Also, can, if you saw it real going really back, I'm sorry. You can filter by movies, games, apps, websites, TV shows. Um, lots of different filters here. And so taking a look at Black Panther, which was a, was a great movie, you can see it gives a parent some advice. Um, it says the age recommendation, common sense says 12 plus, and then it kind of gives us our Amazon review style. Uh, parents say 12 plus, and that's based on 112 reviews from parents, and kids say 10 plus, and that's based from 135 reviews from kids. And so I don't think this is the end all be all um, for you. As a parent, you need to kind of make your judgments as you will, but it's definitely, um, I think, important to look at. I also like they have this section here about a parent's guide, and does it have positive messages? Does it have positive role models? Is there violence? Is there consumerism? What's the language like? How much sex is there? Is there drunk, drinking, drugs, and smoking? Some good questions on uh, what parents need to know. Again, you can even look at the reviews that um, the parents say, that the kids say. And then I also really like this, talk to your kids about. And so there's a little section here that um, perhaps uh, gives you some conversation starters to have with your kids. Um, and so I think these are some great questions if you are going to watch these movies um, to have. doesn't mean it has to you know, be an hour lesson, but maybe it's just a five-minute conversation about some of those things. And so... Of course, you, this offers, you know, movies, as I said, um, lots of different apps, video games, uh, books, things like that. So whenever my kids ask me if they can watch a particular movie, this is the first place I go. And we look at it and we say, hey, this is what kids say. This is what parents say. Let's talk about when it might be appropriate for you to be able to watch this. And so although I think Black Panther is a great movie, my oldest child is 10. And so my, my younger kids are not quite that old. And so we're not quite ready for it yet as a family. Um, just kind of going back to the presentation and just showing you a few more examples, as you can see. Um, so again, lots of different options, uh, but a great resource. And so um, you can see like Guardians of the Galaxy, just some information on that, 12 plus. Again, some of the same information. I took these as screenshots. Um, this is about six months old, some of this, some of this is a little bit newer. Diver Wimpy Kid, who do you think is suitable for? Uh, Common Sense Media says nine plus. And you can see here, not too many positive messages, a little bit of violence, a tiny bit of sex, a tiny bit of language, and a tiny bit of drugs, drinking, or smoking. So again, we see our kids with ha having these, maybe this book, but are we asking them any questions about it? I've actually read one myself. Wasn't the biggest fan personally, but Kids out there, some of them like it. Call of Duty 3. 
I don't know how many kids or how many parents. The T, it says teen right there. But um, anyways, that's just me. Sorry. Get off my bandwagon, my soapbox here. Kids say 11 plus, parents say 12 plus. But you can see there's lots of violence and there's language. Um, like even games like Fortnite, are we looking that up and are we seeing, is that appropriate for my kid to be able to play? Here's one, Epic for Books. Oh, this one's great for four plus. Great educational value, very easy to play. There's a few books that are scary in there. I think a little bit of consumerism. Um, so, again, if you want to go and check that out, that's commonsensemedia.org, and then they just have tons and tons of great resources. So before maybe you let your kid play that, just out of curiosity, Fortnite... See, I've never played it. I've seen it a little bit. Everything you need to know about Fortnite. For this, it says 13 plus. Parents say 11. Kids say 10. Um, so you can see the ratings. And if you want to go look more, you can go ahead and check that out. So uh, next steps here. I think the next steps is you can check out Common Sense. They also have a Facebook group for educators and they have a Facebook group for parents. So they always post some great information on that as well, and it just goes right to your phone. Notification, Facebook. Uh, so here's for me some of my next steps. Um, my biggest thing is always trying to have a conversation with my family about these things as they are, and sometimes it's hard. But um, like my, as I said, before my daughter got her iPod, we started having some conversations and having her... Rather than just setting up the account for her, let's set up the account together so she's more aware of it. Um, talk about the settings uh, that are on there. Uh, we actually have kind of come out with some agreements, her specifically, but as a family, about how much screen time are we going to get and when we use our technology, when it's appropriate. Um, one of the things... <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. One of the things I'm working on is definitely... Uh, making sure, you know, when I come home, I put my phone down and I'm not connected to all the buzzing and beeping. That's whether it's work or friends or family. Being present with those people around me and something I'm still working on for sure. And finally, check out Common Sense Media. Again, they are a nonprofit. There are no ads there and they are powered by you. So uh, check it out for sure. Definitely a great resource. Um I've never done this before, this webinar, so it was a good experience. Definitely uh, interesting having yourself kind of talk for 45 minutes, whether people are watching or not watching. We'd love to have you give us some feedback when you're done. You can go to tinyurl.com forward slash FB for Facebook. Um, that's at the end of the slides. If you got them, which should be in the link, uh, feel free to share those and use those as you will. <clears throat> um... And again, please feel free if you have any questions, you can reach out to me on Facebook. You can reach out to me on Twitter. Um, I'm sure you could reach out to Josh and you can reach out to George. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Again, uh, check out Common Sense Media. Hope you had a great night. Um, and this is me and we are signing off. <laughs>